Frank, the anthropic principle is something that has become more and more powerful in terms of its explanatory powers uh, about the nature of reality. You were there almost at the beginning and helped formulate it. Uh, give me some sense of that time, what the reaction was originally, your experience with the anthropic principle. I was at the time when I first encountered the anthropic principle, a um, postdoctoral student at Berkeley. John Barrow um, was also a postdoc at Berkeley. And we got together to discuss mutual projects that might be fun to work on. We noticed that Brandon Carter, who originated the term and many of the crucial calculations involving the anthropic principle, had never published his central paper. And it was falling out of use and it was out of date. We thought it would be nice to uh, expand it out into perhaps a monograph. That grew, of course, into <laughs> our book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, which we tried to discuss all aspects of the anthropic cosmological. Big book. Yes, big book, because there's a lot of many, huge number of ramifications of the relationship of man and the cosmos. We wanted to discuss them all. Now, at what the, was your unifying principle behind it as you began that book? Try to be as accurate in our descriptions of this question, what is the relationship of man and the universe, but always from the physics point of view. We gave great emphasis to what is called the weak anthropic principle, which Brandon Carter said if he had to do it again, he would have called it the selection principle because it does something very reasonable physically. It says we must remember that we are human beings measuring the universe, and when we are doing so, we have to be subject to the limitations that human beings actually exist <laughs> when we're carrying out the measurements. That's so obvious when you say it, but the implications are huge. For example, the universe is now expanding. As it expands, it cools off. We therefore could not measure the universe when the whole universe was, say, 3,000 degrees. Not only would it have been too hot for human life to exist, but at that time in universal history, from uh, 300,000 years after the beginning, the elements which make us up, elements heavier than hydrogen, had not yet Didn't been exist. synthesized. So no human life was possible in that environment. So why do we see the universe at a relatively cool temperature of 2.726 degrees? Because that's the only type of environment in which we could measure the universe. That's the weak principle. That's the weak principle. It says purely and simply selection. The other principles are far more interesting. The strong anthropic principle says that Life is not an accident. In some way, we are essential to the cosmos. We have a crucial role to play in universal history. And the question is, what exactly is this important role? Well, uh, there's an earlier question. The weak anthropic principle really makes sense. Now that you have the strong principle, it, it's not immediately obvious why that's the case. That's certainly true. But even the weak anthropic principle got John and myself into trouble. <laughs> because one way you can apply the weak anthropic principle is remember how I applied it earlier in this conversation to universal history. We are looking at ourselves now, looking at the temperature of the universe, realizing that we can only measure the properties of the universe in a relatively cool universe at this point in its history. But we know there was an earlier history. But one way you can try to apply the weak anthropic principle is to address the question, why do the constants of nature have the values they actually do? Why are the dimensions of space three and not seven or a hundred thousand or whatever? Um, why are the physical laws the way they are? You could imagine that this universe is divided into sub-universes which have different dimensions, which have different laws of physics, which have different co uh, constants of nature. But we wouldn't exist we in wouldn't, the vast We numbers. particular human beings would not exist there 
because we are based on um, matter, the forces which govern our daily working of primarily electromagnetism. So obviously you have to have electromagnetism primary and all the other forces secondary. You have to adjust the constants of the laws of physics for which that will be true. You can easily write down versions of the standard model in which that's not true. Um, you can invent new laws of physics. You can, of course, change the dimensions of physics and so on. We were ferociously attacked when the book first came out in the mid-1980s by physicists who were looking for a unique theory that will describe everything and explain why the universe has precisely three dimensions, why these particular forces, and so forth. In necessary mathematical terms. Terms, it follows necessarily from general aesthetic postulates which everybody can agree on that there could be only one that mathem forces one way yes. of doing things. They would argue that there could be only one possible laws of physics because every other possible law of physics would be mathematically inconsistent. And that your is, view was taking a very different view. Yes, take a very different view that there could be these other possibilities out there. However, it was not compelling as this temperature argument I gave. Why? Well, we know from observations that there was a time when the universe was much hotter than it is now. So we're not conjecturing about the existence of this other state. Whereas if you imagine other regions of the universe far outside our ability to see them, that's what you're really doing. You're imagining. You have no direct evidence that these things actually exist. This is one of the, I think, partially legitimate reasons for criticizing mm -hmm. this application of the weak anthropic principle. However, what has happened in the uh, subsequent 20 years after the publication of the book is the physicists who had hoped to find this unique theory of physics have failed in their endeavor. What they're seeing is vastly a vast number of possible universes. And they can't find any way from pure mathematical consistency for selecting this one or that one. In fact, it's become more popular to think that the universe has 11 dimensions rather than the observed three spatial dimensions. Where do you get rid of the other dimensions? Um, well, we can imagine cases in which these other dimensions make themselves manifest but other regions of reality, in our region of reality, it's just the three. The others in some way are wrapped up so we can't see it. Yeah, compactified <laughs> is the technical word. Um, and what is happening is we human beings can only observe this particular type of universe. We can come into existence only if those dimensions have been compactified, only if the fine structure constant has a value of very close to 1 over 137, and I could go on. So the physicists, having failed to find, to find the, one the, theory, the one unit theory, I now find <clears throat> the anthropic selection principle very, very attractive. Because, because the alternative for them is to have no theory at all. Or to have postulate a theistic solution. That, I'm afraid, is the case. Because the theistic solution, God is somehow selecting it. Well, that's in the end what I think mathematical consistency will force <laughs> these guys into. Because but the weak, weak anthropic principle now has been accepted by many physicists precisely because who it use it to select among this vast landscape yes. of different physical universes yes. in which we have to exist. Yes, that's why they like to apply it, because they are convinced from their mathematics, putting the mathematics as prior rather than experiment, a terrible mistake for a physicist, <laughs> um, they are convinced that this landscape is actually, it really exists out there, and the only reason to explain why we're in this particular landscape is anthropic selection. That's right. That is the only way if, in fact, this region actually exists. We have to therefore ask, does this additional region actually exist? I think not, actually, because I think that the known laws of physics are consistent in and of themselves to explain everything we see.